At the outbreak of World War I in August of 1914, Lord Kitchener, who was the British Secretary of State for War, believed very early on that overwhelming manpower would be the key to winning the war. So he began to look for ways to encourage men of all classes to join the British Army. Now this was a concept that flew in the face of centuries of British military tradition in which the British Army had always relied on a very small but professional group of soldiers. And they had always drawn the members uh, of their officer class from the gentry and the lower classes were where they got most of their enlisted men. But it was General Sir Henry Rawlinson who would go on to command the army here at the Somme who suggested that men would be more inclined to enlist in the army if they knew that they were going to serve alongside their friends, family, and co-workers. And so he appealed to London stockbrokers to raise a battalion of men from the workers in the city of London to set an example. 1,600 men enlisted in what became the 10th Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers, the so-called Stockbrokers Battalion, within a week in late August of 1914. A few days later, the Earl of Derby decided to raise a battalion very similar to that out of men from Liverpool. Within two days, 1,500 men had joined this new battalion. Speaking to these men, Lord Darby said, quote, This should be a battalion of pals, a battalion in which friends from the same office will fight shoulder to shoulder for the honor of Britain and for the credit of Liverpool. End quote. Within the next few days, three more battalions were raised in Liverpool. And so these four battalions formed the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th battalions of the King's Regiment. Encouraged by Lord Darby's success, Lord Kitchener promoted the idea of organizing similar recruitment drives all throughout Britain. By the end of September of 1914, more than 50 towns had formed PALS battalions. The larger towns and cities were able to form several battalions each. So, for example, Manchester, they were able to raise four battalions in August and four more a few months later. From the perspective of the war office, these PAL battalions were just an incredible experiment because they relieved the heavy strain not only on recruiting uh, a suddenly much more expanded regular army, but they also relieved the financial strain because they decided in September of 1914 uh, that the organizers of these battalions would be responsible for meeting the initial costs of their accommodation and other uh, training costs until the war office would take over. And that worked out really well for the war office, but also for the men, because uh, this meant that many of these new recruits in these PALS battalions were initially able to live at home. They would go to training during the day in their local community with the other men, and then they would come home after a day of basic training. The Accrington Pals are probably the best remembered of the battalions that were raised in the early months of the First World War in response to Kitchener's call for a volunteer army. Groups of friends from all walks of life in Accrington and its neighboring towns enlisted together to form their own battalion with a distinctively local identity. A month after the outbreak of the war, the Accrington Observer and Times newspaper of September 8, 1914, reported that the War Office had accepted an offer made by the mayor of Accrington, Captain John Harwood, to raise a complete battalion. When recruitment began on the 14th of September, 104 men were accepted in the first three hours. Brothers, cousins, friends, workmates enlisted together, and within 10 days, the Accrington Battalion had all but reached a full strength of 1,100 men. 
Now around half the battalion had been recruited from Accrington. The majority of the remainder had been raised in neighboring towns such as Burnley, Chorley, and Blackburn. But they all came from basically the same area. Throughout the early months of the battalion's existence, the men trained and drilled in and around their hometowns, like most of the PALS battalions did. In February of 1915, they were given this magnificent send-off as they left Accrington for training at Carnarvon, where Lieutenant Colonel A.W. Rickman of the Northumberland Fusiliers took command of the battalion. In May of 1915, the battalion moved from Carnarvon to Penkridge Bank Camp near Rugley, outside of Birmingham, where it joined the 12th, 13th, and 14th battalions of the York and Lancaster regiments to form the 94th Brigade of the 31st Division. The battalion made further moves in July and then in September of 1915 before they embarked in December for Egypt, of all places, to counter a Turkish threat against the Suez Canal. That danger soon passed, and in the last week of February of 1916, the 31st Division was ordered to France to take part in the preparations for the joint British and French attack that was to come here at the Somme. The objective of the PALS battalions of the 94th Brigade was to capture the hilltop fortress of Serre and form a defensive flank facing northeast and north. They were the northernmost point on the attack at the Somme on July 1st. That attack was to be led by the 11th East Lancashires on the right and the 12th York and Lancasters, the Sheffield City Battalion, on the left. The 1st and 2nd Barnsley PALS, the 13th and 14th York and Lancasters, were in support, in reserve, uh, for those leading battalions. Facing them in Serre was the 169th Infantry Regiment of the German Army, the 8th Baden Infantry. On the 24th of June, as was true all the way along the line, the British artillery opened a bombardment that was to continue until the very morning of the attack. This bombardment was intended to destroy the German defenses, but also open holes in the barbed wire uh, and allow for easy access to uh, the strong points. But it failed to penetrate through to many of the underground shelters and it left much of the barbed wire intact. In the early evening of the 30th of June, the 11th East Lancashires left their camp at Warnemont Wood for a seven mile journey to the trenches here in front of Serre. The lead elements didn't even arrive on the front until 2.40 a.m. on the morning of Saturday, July 1st, just a few hours before the attack was meant to commence. These areas were already heavily shell damaged. The buildup had not gone, gone unnoticed by the Germans. And as daylight broke, the forward lines were getting pounded by German artillery. The woods behind me today are known as Sheffield Memorial Park, and it's a, a place in honor of the members of the PALS battalions who attacked here on the morning of July 1st of 1916. But at the time, they were actually four distinct tiny copses of trees, and you can see how it runs all the way down. They've merged together, the trees have grown since then, and they were known as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm standing in front of Mark right now. And if we turn around, just on the other side of that cemetery would have been the German lines. It was only about 300 yards. And so you could think, okay, you know, 300 yards, we could do that. We can cross that amount of territory. Beyond that, 
uh, right where the woods are is where the village of Serre is actually uh, located. But it wasn't as easy as it looked, as the men found out very quickly. So here's a map that, that gives you a really good sense of things. We are right here uh, on the edge. This is about where the Accrington Palace Monument is. We are right on the edge uh, of the attack line. This is the 11th Battalion East Lancashire Regiment. That's the Accrington Palace. Uh, and then you can see the other, the other PALS units, and they had moved up uh, over time to where we are now. And then you can see the German lines. There was a machine gun right there. There's other ones here, here, here. And then you can see where they advanced throughout the day. There were four trench lines and then fortifications actually inside the town of Serre itself. Just a brutal place to attack. At around 6.30 in the morning, the British artillery began its final bombardment of the German front lines. As shells continued to burst on the Germans' front trench, the men of the 3rd and 4th companies of the German 169th Infantry scrambled from underground shells, bringing up their machine guns, their rifles, and their grenades, ready to put them onto the, fire, the attacking troops. At 7.30 a.m., the bombardment was lifted from the German front lines and the leading waves of the PALS battalions rose up and began to walk toward the German positions. They were convinced that the front lines had been eliminated and so there was really no threat and so they walked. But they found out almost immediately in that 300 yards of deadly space that the Germans were very much active and they tore huge holes in the advancing lines of infantry. One British observer likened the lines of dead to, quote, swaths of cut corn at harvest time. Now, as credible, incredible as it seems, groups of pals defied the machine gun fire. They threaded their way through the barbed wire and they dropped into the German front line trenches. On their left, some of the 12th York and Lancasters also fought their way through. But it was all in vain. Behind them, the third and fourth waves also suffered horrifying losses before they even reached no man's land because of the German artillery. The leading companies of the 13th York and Lancasters were cut down. Some of the PALs, their officers having been killed or wounded, pressed on toward the town of Serre, and they were never seen again. The remaining survivors in the German front line, having received no reinforcements, were forced to withdraw. By 8 a.m., just 30 minutes into the fight, the battle for Serre was effectively over. The history of the East Lancashire Regiment in the Great War records that out of 720 Accrington Pals who took part in that attack, in just the span of a half hour, 584 were killed, wounded, or missing. Brigadier General H. C. Reese of the 94th Brigade said, quote, the result of the high explosive shells, the shrapnel, the machine gun fire, and the rifle fire was such that hardly any of our men even reached the German front trench. The lines which advanced in such admirable order melted away under fire, yet not a man wavered. Not a man broke the ranks or attempted to go back. I have never seen, indeed could never have imagined such a magnificent display of gallantry, discipline, and determination. Now back home in England, the initial accounts of success on the Somme, including an erroneous report of the capture of the town of Serre, soon gave way to newspaper pages filled with photographs of the killed, wounded, and missing. Few, if any, of the town's population could have been untouched by the tragedy. 
Percy Holmes, who was the brother of one of the original members of the Pals, recalled, quote, I remember when the news came through to Accrington that the Pals had been wiped out. I don't think there was a street in Accrington that didn't have their blinds drawn, and the bell at Christ Church tolled all the day. Sergeant John William Streets, who was one of the pals. He was in the 12th Battalion, York and Lancaster, the Sheffield Pals. He was also a poet. He wrote these words. Behind that long and lonely trenched line to which men come and go, where brave men die, there is a yet unmarked and unknown shrine, a broken plot, a soldier's cemetery. Sergeant Streets was killed in the attack on Sarah on the morning of July 1st. His body lay in no man's land as thousands of others did for almost 10 months before he was eventually recovered and he was believed to have been buried here at the Houston Road Cemetery. He was 31 years old. This is a memorial to him. Around the time his body was recovered, a collection of poems that he wrote was posthumously published under the title The Undying Splendor. And this is what he wrote. Reach out thy hands, thy spirit's hands to me, and pluck the youth, the magic from my heart, magic of dreams whose sensibility is plumed like the light, visions that start, mad pressure in the blood, desire that thrills, the soul with mad delight to yearning wed. All slothfulness of life draw from its bed, the soul of dawn across the twilight hills. Reach out thy hands, O spirit, till I feel that I am fully thine, for I shall live in the proud consciousness that thou dost give. And if thy twilight fingers round me steal and draw me unto death, thy votary am I, O life. Reach out thy hands to me. At the time of the Great War, Newfoundland was not a part of Canada. It was a separate British dominion. Most of us today think of Newfoundland as uh, in that extreme eastern part of Canada, but at the time it wasn't. And Newfoundland here at the Somme, as a percentage of men involved, probably suffered the worst. We're standing in the Newfoundland Memorial Park. It is by far the best preserved part of the Somme battlefield, probably one of the best preserved sites on the entire Western Front. You can come here and in the midst of the Somme River Valley where you have miles and miles of flat farmland where in 1916 there were trenches that ran all the way from the channel down to the border with Switzerland. Most of those trenches are gone now. Most of the evidence other than the cemeteries, most of the evidence that there was ever a, one of the worst battles in human history here is gone. But here on I think 70 acres, it's completely preserved. You can see the trenches where the Newfoundlers, Newfoundlanders were uh, coming out of the trenches to fight. You can actually go across and see the German trenches, and you can, you can, better than anywhere else on this battlefield, really get an understanding of exactly where everyone was and where the enemy was, and vice versa. And there are even some cemeteries on this property. So we're just going to look around a little bit and, and talk a little bit about what happened on this site.
know it's, it's difficult to imagine, but these trenches, I know for all of us, they define the war, but I don't think we fully understand what life was like here. Um, yes, there was the mud and the rain and the, and the dirt and the uh, difficult conditions, but the men were in these trenches for weeks, sometimes for months. Sometimes when the shelling got real bad, they couldn't leave. Especially early on in the war, before they were extended and, and other places were made, men were going to the bathroom in these trenches. They would, they would often use helmets to go to the bathroom in, and then they would dump them over the side as far away from the trench as they could. Uh, but you can only do that so much. Often men died in these trenches, and they couldn't go out to bury them, and so they buried them in the trench. You were walking over top of your comrades' graves. And you knew that if you were killed, that's where you were going to end up. Uh, there are descriptions by the soldiers of just the mass of thousands of flies that would descend on them in the trenches uh, because of the bodies, because of the smell, because of all of the various things that you can imagine. You had to eat there. You had to sleep there. You lived there. Uh, you weren't showering. You weren't in a bed. You weren't particularly warm, especially at this time of year. Uh, it was take your worst nightmare and multiply it by 10 and then add the drum roll of artillery fire from huge guns. Just boom, 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 boom all the time. Honestly, to me, in studying all of history, if there's one war I would not want to be a soldier in, it was this one. And it's because of that. It's because of the artillery. It's because of the conditions. Uh, I just honestly don't know that there's ever been anything like it. As in other places on the battlefield, there was a week-long bombardment of the German position. The German position was off in the distance there. It's an area known as Y Ravine. It's one of the few places on the battlefield where the Germans were actually in a lower position than the British and Commonwealth forces were. Uh, typically, they were attacking uphill. But in this case, there's kind of a natural fortification with that ravine. And so the, the Germans were dug in well there and it protected them from the artillery as was the case uh, in most places. And so when the Newfoundlanders rose up to attack, they began to attack over open ground. And you can see just behind me, the main line is about where that uh, monument is. It's probably a hundred yards away. And where I'm standing now, is about as far as most of them got. Right behind me here are the petrified remains of what is known as the danger tree. It's called the danger tree because uh, this kind of marks the middle of no man's land. It, it marks the spot that as far as most of them got because what happened was right down here, you can see where the ground dips. And so there was this kind of natural dip that uh, if you look across at where the Germans were, I'm right at about the same level as the Germans right now. And so if you dip down, uh, I guess the thought was that the machine gunners could not hit you down there. And that offered some protection. So a lot of men aimed for this position to try and get here, to get down to that position, uh, to get away from the gunfire. But of course, uh, that just meant that a lot of bodies piled up in this area. Uh, as they all huddled toward the same spot. 
the casualties were severe. The 1st Battalion suffered 86% casualties on this field. 86%. When we talk about the American Civil War, the, uh, the, the gold standard for worst casualties is typically the 26th North Carolina at Gettysburg, uh, who suffered around 80%. The 1st uh, Minnesota was right around that same area, about 80%, but 86%. There were 700 casualties. There were less than 70 men that were available for roll call the next morning. I mean, those are just almost impossible to believe numbers. There were 14 sets of brothers who were killed on this field. Four lieutenants from the same family died here. When you talk to the people of Newfoundland, this is, this is the place. In all of their history, this is the place that is remembered. This is the place that is honored. It's one of, I think, only two places outside of Canada that are Can Canadian national memorials, national monuments. This is a place of great honor, but also a place of great horror for the people of Newfoundland. The commander of the 29th Division whose men were attacking here would go on to say after the battle that it was a magnificent display of valor by these men and it only failed because dead men can advance no further. That kind of sums it up. This is one of a couple of cemeteries here. This is the Y Ravine Cemetery. And as with other cemeteries, you'll see a lot of July dates and then a lot of November dates. And that indicates that that second major attack that happened that took a lot of the ground that they failed to take in July. Uh, interesting to note that in addition to the Newfoundlanders and the Highlanders of Scotland, the 51st Division who fought here, uh, there are also a lot of South Wales borderers, and if you're familiar at all with the British Army, you may recognize that name. The South Wales borderers were the same regiment, um, I think it's the 24th Regiment of Foot, that fought in the Zulu War at places like Islan Luana and Rourke's Drift. Those were the South Wales borderers.
who loves history, I really appreciate this monument. It says, Scotland, by this monument in the land of her ancient ally and comrade in arms, commemorates those officers and men of the 51st Highland Division who fell in the Great War. The alliance between France and Scotland in the years before Scotland and England were united under one crown was known as the Old Alliance, A-U-L-D, Alliance. And it was one of the things that helped keep Scotland independent for so long because she knew she could count on France as an ally to keep England in check from coming and, and gobbling them back up again. And it was only when Queen Elizabeth passed away in the early part of the 17th century uh, that the throne passed to her cousin who was the King of Scotland, King James VI, who became King James I of England and the two became united under one crown and eventually united uh, as the uh, island of Great Britain and then later the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So there are a lot of stories that come out of the Great War, uh, a lot of lore, a lot of history that gave a lot of units their identities. For example, the United States Marine Corps uh, at Bellow Wood and uh, the nickname that they came out of the Great War with, the Devil Dogs. And there was always the story that th they had been named Devil Dogs by the Germans because of how they fought, but the fact was that that was a name that probably was given to them by Americans. It appeared in print in the United States long before they went into action in the Great War. There's a similar story that I actually wanted to do an entire video about, and it was going to be titled The Ladies from Hell about the 51st Highland Division. But as I started doing research into this story, I found out the truth. So the Highlanders wore, skirt, wore uh, kilts and the, the Germans called them skirts. Uh, that part is true. Uh, they didn't really understand that culture, uh, that part of a Scottish heritage, which really doesn't go back all that far. It certainly doesn't go back to the time of William Wallace, but it is a part of Scottish heritage. And uh, so when these Highlanders showed up fighting that way, the story goes that because of the way that they fought, the Germans nicknamed them the ladies from hell. Uh, but nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, the Germans, probably more than any other army on the Western Front, their soldiers kept diaries, a lot of them, and we have a lot of those. Not a single German soldier ever refers to the Highlanders that way in any of their writings. All of the sources we have that call the Highlanders the ladies from hell are on the Allied side. So it's a cool story. Uh, and, and it's kind of neat to think about the Germans calling them that and then seeing how viciously they fought despite the fact they were wearing skirts as the Germans thought them to be. Um, but the fact is that it's just really kind of a propaganda thing more than anything. But that doesn't take away from how incredibly well uh, these men fought. Men such as the Black Watch. And is there a better name for a unit anywhere in the world? than the Black Watch. I absolutely love that. And that's a unit that I plan to do a lot more research into before my next trip here. Um, but you have the Gordon Highlanders, and of course you have um, the Pals Battalions from places like Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, who all fought just incredibly well on these fields.
Here's something I've talked about some on the channel. Uh, you can see the red sign. They call these red zones for a reason. Uh, you have to imagine that in places like the Somme, Verdun, other places along the line, there were literally millions of artillery shells that were fired. Some estimates are as high as a third, but certainly as at least a fifth, somewhere between a fifth and a third of all of those artillery shells that were fired were duds. They didn't explode, which means that there are literally millions of unexploded rounds that were laying all over these battlefields, and many of them are still there. And I don't know what the rate is or how often it happens, but I know people continue to die because of the Great War, because every so often someone encounters one of those unexploded shells and they don't know what it is or they don't know what to do with it or they mishandle it and it goes off and they end up killed. The French army will gather those up. There are places where farmers, for example, when they're plowing their fields and they dig up some of this unexploded ordnance, they'll place them in a pile on the side of the road and the French army will come around for what they call the iron harvest and gather up what has been harvested that year by the farmers. It's a continual problem and it's something, you know, as an American, uh, the only war that was really fought on our soil was the Civil War in any large numbers and, and even the American Civil War. I mean, there was the revolution, but it was so small in scale even compared to the Civil War, but the Civil War, war is dwarfed in comparison to what, to what happened on the Western Front in World War I, and then of course they had World War II fought here as well. And uh, so these people live on battlefields that literally can kill them. It's an ongoing issue. So just once again, I wanna kind of put in perspective this attack. Just in front of the statue over there, you can see kind of the build-up area where the, the frontline trenches are for the British. I'm maybe 100 yards away from there now, which puts me right in line with the danger tree. So 100 yards is about as far as most of them ever made it. Now over there, just in front of those trees is the German frontline trenches. It's probably 300 yards away. It's, I don't know, it's sad, it makes me angry, it's frustrating, but it's not unique to here. That was the way it was all along the lines. And, and who's to blame for that? Well, you know, a lot of people, the popular thing to do is to blame the generals, uh, in particular men like General Sir Henry Rawlinson, who was in command of the army who fought here. Um, but that, this is, the psalm is hardly unique in that. There were plenty of attacks where everyone thought the artillery softened up the target, only to find out that it didn't. I think it's the scale of this attack and the scale of the number of dead. 19,000 British soldiers killed in the first day, most of them within a couple of hours uh, that people tend to point to about this place. But it, that wasn't even the greatest loss of life for an army in one day during the Western Front. The French lost more than that in one day back in the early months of the war. I think they lost over 20,000 killed in one day. Uh, but for the collective British memory, for the Canadians, for the Scottish, for the Australians and the New Zealanders and the South Africans and the Irish and uh, the men from India and all of these other places. The Somme and Ypres, especially Passchendaele, which was I think the third battle of Ypres, those become the things that are in the collective memory as the horrors of the Western Front. And it's hard to get a picture of that today because it's so peaceful and it's so quiet. But when you start to see the cemeteries everywhere, then you start to understand. This was not a place anybody want, would want to be 
And uh, I do this because I want their stories to be told. It's been 100 years, and honestly, I don't think that many people, even people who are interested in history, know a whole lot about the Great War. And I think it was the defining war of the 20th century, not World War II, not Korea, not Vietnam, not Afghanistan, not any of these other places where various nations fought. And I mean the Soviets in Afghanistan, not uh, America before you send me a message that that wasn't the 20th century. Um, It was here. This was the defining moment of the 20th century and probably one of the defining moments of world history. And I wish more people knew about it. Behind me where the trees are is the Hawthorne Ridge Crater. It's the site of one of nearly 20 mines that were exploded by the British on the morning of July 1st, 1916 to signal the start of the Somme Offensive. It's one of the most well-known of the craters and one of only a few that can still be seen today. The area that was targeted by the mine was known as Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt. That's the ridge there. It was a German frontline fortification west of the village of Beaumont Hamel on the Somme River. The redoubt was built after the end of the Battle of Albert in late September 1914. So the Germans had been there for the better part of a year and a half, almost two years at this point. And as the French and later the British attacks on the Western Front became more and more formidable, the Germans continued to build up the fortifications and trench positions near their original lines around Hawthorne Ridge. No man's land in this sector ranged anywhere from between 200 and 500 yards between the British and the German lines. The ground's mostly flat and clear of obstructions. It's got hills, you know, sloping ridges, but uh, there's one tiny spot in all of this sector that's not flat and in the open. And that is this low bank known as the Sunken Ridge. And we're going to take a look at that in just a minute. This is a commanding position for the Germans. They could use it for artillery observers to easily see the British lines uh, and to be able to fire and coordinate that fire effectively. The British, on the other hand, couldn't see past the German support trenches. And the shape of this land, which is much more hilly than I thought it would be, The shape of the land here makes it very difficult for heavy artillery for the British to hit those German frontline positions. And so as the British prepared for their offensive along the Somme, the 29th Division was given the task of taking the Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt. To try and make their job a little bit easier, the um, division employed a series of miners uh, to dig mines for communication, for transportation, and of course for explosives detonation. The 252nd Tunneling Company of the Royal Engineers, who were nicknamed the Moles, were given the task. 
The main gallery was dug 60 feet underground and stretched a thousand yards. That's more than a half a mile from the British lines to the strong point under the redoubt where those trees are. The mine was then packed with 40,000 pounds of explosives made from ammonium nitrate and aluminum powder. The 8th Corps commander, Lieutenant General uh, Aimer uh, Hunter Weston, that's a mouthful of a name, um, wanted to, the mine to be set off actually four hours before the attack so the Germans would think the attack was coming and then let their guard down when nothing happened. But uh, that was overruled by 4th Army Headquarters, and they decided that all mines should be detonated no more than just a few minutes before the attack. So every day for the week preceding the attack, a bombardment would con commence at 5 a.m. You figure if you're the Germans after a while, you really just don't know what's happening because no, no attack's coming. So the hope was that the Germans would think no attack was imminent when the bombardment occurred on the morning of the attack. So on the morning of July 1st, the men of the 29th Division were to advance east across the valley behind a creeping barrage that would get closer and closer to the German lines. They would first secure the very first line of defenses and then follow that artillery barrage as it crept further to the east so they could capture additional trench lines throughout the day. The Hawthorne Ridge mine was set to go off 10 minutes before the attack. That's several minutes before any of the other mines along the line. And the hope was that the German attention would not be focused or would be focused here and not on more strategic locations where the 10th Corps and the 15th Corps were going to be attacking further to the south. British cinematographer Jeffrey Malins was on hand to film the attack by the 29th Division. The men of the 1st Battalion of the Lancashire Fusiliers had moved out into no man's land to this spot behind me known as the Sunken Road, which is one of the very few spots anywhere uh, on this part of the battlefield where you can get some uh, cover and not be out in the open. There's this iconic footage of the men of that unit here waiting to go over the top after the mine exploded. Within a half hour of that footage being shot, many of those men would be dead on the battlefield. Malins then went to another location and set up his camera to record the explosion of the Hawthorne mine from about a half a mile away. Here's what he said about it. He said, quote, The ground where I stood gave a mighty convulsion. It rocked and swayed. I gripped hold of my tripod to steady myself. Then for all the world, like a gigantic sponge, the earth rose high in the air to the height of hundreds of feet. Higher and higher it rose. And with a horrible, grinding roar, the earth settles back on itself, leaving in its place a mountain of smoke. End quote. As soon as the mine blew, the British artillery opened with what was known as a hurricane bombardment of the German lines. This was meant to be a quick but devastating precision artillery strike on the focal point of the attack. It didn't have the desired effect. Two platoons of the 2nd Battalion Royal Fusiliers, along with four machine guns and four Stokes mortars, went over the top and rushed toward the crater.
The German position here at the Hawthorne Ridge Crater was defended by the 119th Regiment of the 26th Reserve Division. A soldier here on Hawthorne Ridge described from the German perspective what happened, quote, a huge explosion occurred. It was clear that this was not the result of shelling. A terrible rain of earth and stone was coming down on us and a gigantic cloud of dust and smoke was rising into the air just in front of where the 9th Company was positioned. The English had dug a tunnel towards a protruding corner of our defenses, which they called the Hawthorne Redoubt, and they had blown a huge mine below it. More than three groups, and there'd be 10 to 12 men in a group, of the 1st Platoon of 9th Company were killed outright. The dugouts next to them collapsed, trapping the men of four other groups inside. Only two groups could be rescued in time. The explosion had left a crater with a diameter of 50 to 60 meters and a depth of 30 meters and had set the signal for the start of the attack. As the Germans looked out, the, the sun could be seen reflecting on the English bayonet. They were carrying bridges and wooden planks with them to cross the trenches. He said eight dense waves were coming up toward us. Horse artillery and cavalry could be observed. English staff officers were observing the assault, and the Germans could see all of this. He went on to say the 10th and 11th Company greeted the English with a withering hail of machine gun and rifle fire. In the section of 9th Company, which had been taken out of action by the mine, the English bomb throwers and machine gunners managed to break into our trenches toward the left of the huge crater. Here, 3rd Platoon was still trapped inside a large dugout whose four exits had been collapsed when the mine was blown. One of these exits was just being opened up by one of the men. Behind this man were Lieutenant Breitmeier and Oberleutnant Mühlbeier. There was another German soldier who also wrote about what happened, and he described what happened next. Quote, We had only just opened the exit of the dugout when they were upon us. A bayonet thrust killed the man who was holding the shovel. His body fell down the stairs of the dugout, tearing the men that were just in the process of getting down out again. I had no rifle with me, but managed to fire a signal flare into the face of one of the attackers. The English answered by throwing some hand grenades, which forced us to withdraw back inside the dugout. A short and intense close combat developed in which the English were annihilated. Their leader, a most brave lieutenant, was wounded and taken prisoner. The platoon of 9th Company, who had just escaped from the collapsed dugout, now fanned out to man the defenses, just in time to open fire on yet another wave of English infantry supported by machine guns. It was then the enemy broke and started toward his lines in retreat. At 11.30 hours, everything was over. I think it's important to remember as I stand in the middle of the Hawthorne Ridge Crater that this is a war grave. 
There were dozens of German soldiers who were annihilated when this bomb exploded. Uh, many of them probably blown into unrecoverable pieces, but also many buried beneath the tons of earth that were thrown into the air, and you can see that in the video. Uh, and so probably many of them have never been recovered, and this is their final resting place. There is a sign here. It says, Den Toten Kameraden. And it has a list of men who were killed on July 1st, and I'll just read a few of their names. Vermin Jacob uh, Noblich, Reservist Martin Waller, Reservist Eugen Kohler, Musketeer Lenhart Bloch, Musketeer Eugen Zundil, Unteroffizier Thomas Fischer. All of those and, and many other names on this list all died July 1st, 1960. We're standing now in the Beaumont Hommel British Cemetery. You can see just right there the Hawthorne Ridge Crater. Just where these trees are is where the Sunken Lane is. And so many of these men were men that came up and over and probably died right in this field. I thought this, however, was unusual in this cemetery. You see um, a member of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment who was killed in November. In November, there was another significant attack on Hawthorne Ridge, which finally took the position. Uh, and so in a lot of these cemeteries, you'll see a lot of July dates and a lot of November dates because men were killed in the same location, fighting over the same ground at different times. Here you see Private J.W. Jackson of the Lancashire Fusiliers, who was killed probably very near to this spot on July 1st. But then it's right here, what's next, that surprised me. It's an unknown German soldier who somehow ended up in the middle of this British cemetery and has been given uh, the same similar type of marker that all the British soldiers are. And that's one of the things that continues to surprise me in my time in France is the honor that has been shown to the Germans, to their soldiers. It's, um, well, I, it warms my heart, but I would totally understand if they didn't feel that way. They were invaded by these people, and yet they, they show great honor to them, not only from the French, but the British as well. As the Western Front bogged down into trench warfare in the fall of 1914, both sides continually looked for advantages to help them turn the tide against the other. Throughout 1915, the use of mines became routine for both uh, the Central Powers and also the Allies. In June 1916 alone, the Germans had exploded 126 mines across the Western Front, and the British had exploded over 100. Here at the Somme, nearly 20 mines were exploded just on July 1st. 
The most memorable of those mines was here, and it's known as the Lochnagar Mine. Work was started on this mine in December 1915 by the 185th Tunneling Company, and it was eventually finished several months later by the 179th Tunneling Company. The mine itself was over 100 feet deep with four separate passageways that came off of the main gallery. As it began to get closer and closer to the German redoubt, which was known as the Swabia uh, Hill, they had to be as quiet as possible. At that depth, they're most likely digging through chalk filled with flint rocks. And you can see the flint rocks all over the place in farmers' fields here. So for silence, the tunnelers would use bayonets with spliced handles and they would work barefoot on a floor covered with sandbags, all for the sake of silence. The flint rocks, which are everywhere here, were carefully pried out of the chalk and then laid quietly on the floor. One man dug with his bayonet while an assistant caught the dislodged material. That dislodged material, mostly chalk, was then placed in sandbags and passed hand by hand along a row of miners sitting on the floor. This mine was a thousand feet long. Among the most fascinating aspects of mine warfare uh, are the countermining efforts that took place. It was rarely a secret that the enemy was digging mines. Here at the Somme, the Germans were not only well aware that an attack was coming, they were also well aware that mines were being dug under the strong points on their line. And so they would dig mine shafts of their own, hoping to interfere with or even stop the enemy's mine efforts before they were able to explode their mines. And this led to both sides employing techniques to identify where the enemy was digging. But it wasn't easy. Sound travels differently underground, and so it requires a great deal of silence, it requires a great deal of technology, and it requires a great deal of skill to be able to figure things out. One officer on the British side, a man named Captain Stanley Bullock, of the 129th Tunneling Company described how things went. Here's what he said, quote, at one place in particular, our men swore they thought he, the German enemy, was coming through. So we stopped driving forward and commenced to chamber in double shifts. That meant building a chamber instead of just a, a shaft, a gallery. We did not expect to complete it before he blew, but we did. A chamber 12 feet by 6 feet by 6 feet in just 24 hours. The Germans worked for a shift more than we did, and then they stopped. They knew we had chambered and were afraid that we should blow, and no more work was done there. I used to hate going to listen in that chamber more than any other place in the mine. Half an hour, sometimes once, sometimes three times a day, in deadly silence with a geophone to your ears, wondering whether the sound you heard was the Bosch, which was a derogatory word they used for the Germans, I think it means pig, working silently, or was it your own heart beating? God knows how we kept our nerves in judgment. After the Psalm attack, when we surveyed the German mines and connected up to our own system, we found that we were five feet apart and that he had only started his chamber and then stopped. When they got about 130 feet from the German redoubt, the mine was branched into two separate tunnels. 
so that charges could be placed 60 feet apart, about 50 feet beneath the surface of the German position. One of those rooms was packed with 24,000 pounds of explosives, and the other was packed with 36,000 pounds of explosives. When they exploded at 7.28 a.m. on the morning of July 1st, the debris was estimated to have risen 4,000 feet into the air. That's nearly a mile before falling back to the earth, burying many of the German defenders. The crater here, known as the Loch Nagar Crater, is 300 feet across and 90 feet deep. After the explosion came the attack. The 34th Division were all PALS battalions who had answered Lord Kitchener's call and had yet to be tried in battle. They were to make a flanking assault on the German front lines around La Boiselle. The division was made up of the 15th and 16th Royal Scots of Edinburgh City, the 10th Lincolns, who were known as the Grimsby Chums, the 11th Suffolks, who were the Cambridge Pals, and eight battalions of Northumberland Fusiliers, the uh, Tyneside Scottish and the Tyneside Irish. Two minutes after the mines exploded, right at 7.30, as with uh, the whole line at that point, the whistles blew and the men went over the top from the safety of their trenches. Over 75% of the men became casualties. In many places, the attackers had to cross nearly half a mile or more of open ground in order to reach the German barbed wire. They were then decimated in no man's land, with survivors seeking refuge down in the newly formed Loch Nagar crater. The Scottish Tynesiders attacked up through Mash Valley, spurred on by their pipers between Wysap crater and La Boiselle to their right. Machine guns tore holes in their lines, and very few made it the 500 yards to the German lines at their position. The Scottish battalions attacking the Swabia Hill strong point alongside Loch Nagar Crater had a shorter distance to go, but an equally terrible machine gun fire again meant that very few reached their objectives. The Irish Tyneside battalions had the greatest distance to make their attacks, 800 yards. They set out from reserve positions nearly a mile behind the British front line when they began. Men were cut down as they moved slowly from the exposed hills. Some did make it forward with a, a very small group eventually reaching their objective at Cantomazon, only to be lost later on. When the day was over, the 34th Division had taken 6,500 casualties. That was the most of any British division on the first day at the Battle of the Somme. This is the Auvillier British Cemetery. Contains the final resting place of about 3,500 British soldiers. 2,500 of them are unknown. It also contains the graves of 100 French soldiers who were killed in 1915 in this area. As I mentioned before, uh, there are men buried all over the Somme and they continue to be found. In the year 2000, 
a man who had previously been listed on the tablet at Deep Fall uh, of the missing was found. They brought him to the cemetery here and 1,500 people showed up for the funeral, including members of his family. His name was George Nugent, and he's buried here today. And I really like what it says on his marker. It says, uh, G.J. Nugent, Tyneside, Scottish, NF. And uh, he was killed at the age of 28 on the 1st of July. But at the bottom it says, lost, found but never forgotten. May he rest in eternal peace. The land on which the Loch Nagar crater sits today is actually privately owned by a British citizen, um, a man named Richard Dunning. And he's done an incredible job. Uh, it's one of the places on the Somme battlefield where there's the most to see and the most to learn about what happened there. There are these plaques absolutely everywhere. And you can actually go to the website and read the text of all of them. And I'm gonna be using the text from some of those plaques uh, in my narration of this site today. Uh, but it's really well done. And I would say that if you're ever going to visit the Psalm, put the Loch Nagar Crater right at the top of your list as far as places you visit, because it's a place you can go without having prepared or done any research and really fully understand everything about this site, about the German defenders, about the miners, about the men who fought here. Uh, and one really cool aspect to this too, and I'll show you in just a second, uh, I guess to probably to raise money, uh, for this site, uh, all of the, the boards on which I'm walking have little plaques at the end of them that are dedicated to various soldiers of the Great War. And I would imagine people probably paid money to do that, and it was a, a fantastic way to not only honor those men, but also uh, to raise the funds to make this site a place that people can come and visit today. When I was recording for my episode on the men who died at the Somme and visiting the various cemeteries, one of the graves that I visited was that of a soldier by the name of George Nugent, whose body was actually only buried in the National Cemetery in the year 2000. He was found in 1998, took some time to identify him, to prepare everything, and then he was laid to rest in the Ovillier Cemetery in 2000. Well, this cross here just a few yards from the edge of the crater marks the spot where George Nugent's body was found in 1998 here at the edge of the crater.
This is Sarah Road Cemetery number one. It's one of a, around 3,000 British Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries here in uh, the Western Front. Not all World War I, some are World War II. But, uh, you know, in my week in France, on the Western Front, I have literally walked or driven past the graves of hundreds of thousands of men from and women from all over the world. Not just Britain and France and Germany, but, you know, I'm standing right here and I'm looking at graves from Australia and New Zealand. There are those from India who fought here and from Africa, from various nations. And um, it, it can get a little overwhelming and it can be difficult to take in. And so what I try to do is remind myself that every grave I see represents a story represents a life and to remember too that hundreds of thousands aren't even in marked graves they're still out on the battlefield somewhere but in order to remind us of the real cost of this war I have tried to take the time to tell some stories of some of the men uh, and women who died in the Great War in the various cemeteries, and I want to do that here today at the Somme. Uh, because the British Commonwealth war graves tend to be in much smaller cemeteries, uh, we're going to walk around uh, several cemeteries today and just share some stories. Come with me as I do that. Horace Isles was 14 years old when he joined up with the Lead Pals, the West Yorkshire Regiment. His sister wrote a letter to him on July 9th, 1916, anxious for news, and this is what she wrote. We did hear that they were fetching all back from France under 19. For goodness sake, Horace, tell them how old you are. I'm sure they'll send you back if they know you're only now just 16. You have seen quite enough. Now just chuck it up and try to get back. You won't fare no worse for it. If you don't do it now, you will come back in bits, and we want the whole of you. Your loving sister, Flory. Flory only discovered that Horace had been killed when she received the letter back, unopened, marked, killed in action. That's how she found out her 16-year-old brother was dead. Horace was just 16th when he, 16 when he died with the 15th Battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment. He was killed along with 2,000 men of the 31st Division who were killed or wounded in the attack on July 1st. This is the Connacht Cemetery, and it's on the sector of the battlefield where many of the Irish soldiers fought. You can see right behind me the Ulster Tower, which is one of the more famous landmarks on the battlefield, which commemorates uh, the men of the 36th Ulster Division and others, uh, including uh, a number of Irish soldiers. The road that runs along here, it's a modern road that's paved today, but at the time uh, it was known by another name. It was known as the Bloody Road. And as I've mentioned previously, many of the soldiers who died in places like the Bloody Road have never been recovered. 
and they continue to be recovered from the battlefield, including three men who rest in this cemetery today. They were found in 2015. One of the three has been identified. We know the units of all three of these men, but we do not know the names of two of them. And they're here, uh, right in the corner of the cemetery. One is a soldier uh, from the Cambridgeshire Regiment, uh, whose name is unfortunately not known. Another is a soldier from the Royal Irish Rifles. And the third is Sergeant D.H. Blakely, uh, who was a member of the Royal Inniskinning Fusiliers, who died uh, in the initial attacks on July 1st of 1960. This is the Lonsdale Cemetery. It's the final resting place of over 1,500 British soldiers and at least one French soldier, which you can see right there with the, uh, the cross. There may be others, but that's the only one I saw. Uh, of the over 1,500 British soldiers buried here, over half are unknown, which is, uh, at least in my experience so far, fairly unusual. Uh, certainly not that many unknown in most of these cemeteries. Uh, this was the site of one of the major attacks that took place on July 1st. Behind me, you see a ridge, and then there's some trees there. Uh, and that is an area known as the Leipzig Redoubt, which was a major strong point for the Germans that was attacked on July 1st. And it was attacked uh, coming out of these woods behind me by two uh, PALS battalions out of Glasgow, Scotland. They were the 16th Highland Light Infantry, who were known as the Glasgow Boys Brigade, and then the 17th Highland Light Infantry, who were known as the Glasgow Commercials. Well, like many other units, they launched their attack, uh, and it's important to note that they didn't just start attacking at 7.30. Most of these units had moved into position overnight, and many of them had actually, using... Um, like trenches that were built toward the German lines and, and using defensive positions had crawled up into no man's land to get closer and then only jumped off, like stood up and started attacking right at 7.30. And that's what happened with these two units of Highland Light Infantry. One uh, second lieutenant uh, named Meadows actually described what happened. He was with the 17th. He said, at 7.25, we left the trench and we walked over to within 60 yards of the barrage. That was the creeping barrage that was leading them uh, toward the German lines. At 7.30, the barrage lifted and we rushed the front line defenses, destroying the garrison in and out of dugouts. I have few definite memories from the time we first saw the Germans to the time the machine guns swept us down outside the Leipzig redoubt. We waited for our own reserve waves and the Lonsdales who should have come on behind, but no reserves reached us. We began to work toward the communication trench, but owing to the lie of the ground, we were badly exposed and I at length found myself the only living occupant of that corner. They were unable, unfortunately, to hold it. And the Lonsdales did attempt to come to their aid, but they took heavy casualties as well. And this cemetery is named after the Lonsdales, even though many, many of the soldiers who are here uh, are from the Highland Light Infantry. And it's one of the, uh, the Highlanders' stories, one of those boys from Glasgow that I'd like to share with you here.
This is Sergeant James Turnbull of the Glasgow commercials, the Highland Light Infantry. And you can see that it says VC after his name, which means he's a recipient of the Victoria Cross. He was a part of taking the Leipzig Redoubt. He was actually a 32-year-old former rugby player. So you can kind of picture in your mind what this man looked like. He helped capture a part of the Leipzig Redoubt which faced several strong German counterattacks later in the day. His official citation reads that he almost single-handed, he maintained his position and displayed the highest degree of valor and skill in performance of his duties. He was killed later on during the day. The largest American cemetery in all of Europe is the Meuse Argonne American Cemetery, which I visited a few days ago. It contains the graves of about 14,000 American service members who died here in France during the Great War. The cemetery that I'm standing in now, the Free Corps German Cemetery outside the town of Albert, is significantly smaller. I mean, way smaller. Uh, couple of acres. I mean, I, I would say it has to be a tenth the size of the American cemetery, if not smaller. But there are more Germans buried here than are Americans buried at the Meuse Argonne Cemetery. There are 17,000 Germans in this cemetery at Free Corps. Now, only, I don't know, a couple thousand have these markers, and each one of these markers has four names on it. Uh, so you can kind of do the math there. Uh, the majority, the vast majority, probably 10,000 or so, are in these three kind of communal graves, um, mass graves. And then there are these plaques, these huge plaques that just have thousands of names and dates on them. It's, it's really quite incredible. About 10,000 of the dead here are from the Battle of the Somme. Uh, 6,000 or so are from the Kaiserschlacht uh, offensive in the spring of 1918. And then the rest are from the early part of the war and then other parts of the war, including the Allied 100 Days offensive that came toward the end of 1918. I've said this before and I'll say it again because it continually just really touches me. The way in which I see the Germans honored here uh, in these various cemeteries, uh, just looking at the main monument up at the, the head of the cemetery, and there are three wreaths full of poppies which have been laid by the Lochnagar Crater Association, which is a British association. And one of them says, in honor of all the brave Germans, who died on the Somme. Germans who died killing British soldiers. I love that a hundred years later, despite the differences, despite all that happened between these sides, that 
that sense of honor and, and decency can be afforded to men who were fighting for their country regardless of what that country was. This is one of the more unique military cemeteries among those in the Somme. We're in the city of Albert, and we're actually in an extension of the city communal cemetery, the private cemetery for citizens. And French cemeteries are beautiful and very different than uh, what we're used to in the United States. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a look at that. But um, here we find the story of a captain of Australian pioneers. And his name was actually a German name. It was uh, Hermann Fritz Hubbe. I don't exactly know how to pronounce that name, but it's H-U-B-B-E. And he described uh, moving toward the front in late July, uh, watching an artillery barrage on a German position that they were preparing to attack. And he wrote these words. He said, flashes like summer lightning were quick and continuous. Make, making one flickering band of light, every now and then a low, lurid red flush, very angry, lit the horizon. All around the horizon, shells were flashing, and the pretty starlights made their graceful curves. He was killed in that battle to come, and he was buried here. He died on the 23rd of July, 1916. A German uh, who was defending in that same position wrote a letter that was discovered later. He actually wrote it the day that Captain Hubba was killed. And this is what he told his wife and children. He called it in hell's trenches. My darlings, the gods only know if I am writing for the last time. We have now been two days in the front trenches. It is not a trench, but a little ditch. Shattered with shells, with not the slightest cover and no protection, we have already lost about 50 men in two days. We get nothing to eat or drink, and life is almost unendurable. To my last moment, I will think of you. There is really no possibility that we shall see each other again. Should I fall, then farewell. This is Flatiron Copes Cemetery. It's the final resting place of 1,500 British Commonwealth uh, soldiers. And I should mention that phrase, uh, that, that word, that descriptive word, uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, for our American audience and others who might not be familiar with it, there are a number of nations uh, that used to be part of what we called the British Empire. Um, but today it's known as the Commonwealth, and so that's the title that is used. Uh, all of these uh, cemeteries are operated by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uh, and so that's the title that we use. Uh, anyway, uh, like many of the cemeteries, uh, this particular cemetery is kind of out of the way. It's down kind of a back road and doesn't really seem to be connected to any of the major areas of combat, but that just goes to show you just how vast this battlefield was. Uh, because these cemeteries are just everywhere. They really are. There's five graves I want to take a look at in here, so let's go.
First grave I want to highlight here is that of Corporal uh, Edward Dwyer, who received the Victoria Cross for his actions in Ypres, uh, further to the north, before his unit, uh, the 1st Battalion of the East Surreys, was sent here to the Somme. Now, what's remarkable about Corporal Dwyer is that he is one of those rare people for whom we actually have an audio recording of him speaking uh, about the war before he was killed. Uh, and that exists to this day because after he received the Victoria Cross, he, he was sent back to Britain for a while to do speaking drives and drum up support for the war, things like that. Uh, very similar to what the United States did in World War II with people like John Bassalone uh, and the, the men who raised the uh, flag over Iwo Jima, people that had performed these great acts of heroism that became celebrities back home. And Eddie Dwyer was one of those people. There was only one thing that could cheer us up on the march, that was singing. We used to sing sippy choruses invented by some of the chaps. Tipperary was in full swing then, and they'd always gone to something they'd invented themselves. It used to buck us up, and we would march all the better for it. Sometimes we'd sing some of the eight Elliot songs, you know, the chocolate colored tunes, but we'd always go into something we'd invented. I don't think I've got much of a voice for singing, but I try and sing one or two of the choruses we used to sing. We're here, because we're here, because we're here, because we're here, we're here, because we're here, because we're here. Because we're here, we'd be far better off, far better off, far better off in a hug. Here we are, here we are, here we are again. Hello, 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 hello. Here we are, here we are, here. Hello, 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 hello. As you walk through this cemetery, it's impossible not to notice these two stones. With the exception of two individual inscriptions, they're identical. They're both lieutenants. They're both last name Tregascus, different first initial. Same regiment, same date of death, one year difference on the age. Arthur and Leonard Tregascus were brothers. They were lieutenants in the same unit, the Welch Regiment, and they were a year apart. One was 32, one was 33, and they were killed within minutes of each other. One of them, I, I apologize off the top of my head, I don't remember which one, had been severely wounded, and the other came to his aid to see how he was, to check on his brother, to make sure he was okay, to treat him if necessary, and then he himself was shot and killed. The parents of the Tregascus brothers received notification about one of them in the morning. They got the notification for the other that night. About 30 feet from the Tregascus brothers are Thomas and Henry Hardwidge. They were in the same regiment. Four days after the Tregascus brothers were killed, uh, Thomas Hardwidge was wounded, and his brother Henry ran to his side to give him water, to give him aid, 
and both men were shot and killed. I wish I could say that these two sets of brothers were the only story like this, but sadly there were dozens of sets of brothers who fell here on the Somme. It's just a, a product of the nature of these units where you have these PALS battalions in particular, these units that are raised from the same towns. Many brothers went to war together and when you have situations where units are completely torn to pieces in a single day, it's inevitable that you're going to have uh, hundreds of stories of family members, brothers, cousins, friends, entire workplaces, entire neighborhoods that are just wiped out in an instant. But that's the song. Manfred Albrecht Freer von Richthofen was born into an aristocratic Prussian family in Breslau in what is now Poland in 1892. His education was in a succession of military schools and academies. He was an excellent athlete, he was a fine horseman, and he was initially commissioned into the 1st Regiment of the Uhlans Kaiser Alexander III in 1911. And after the war started in 1914, he served on both the Western and Eastern fronts as a cavalry officer. By 1915, he was transferred into the Imperial German Army Air Service, and there he studied aerial tactics under the master German strategist, a man named Hauptmann Oswald Bolke. And he flew his first combat mission after less than 30 hours of flight instruction. Now, in spite of a rather rocky start as a fighter pilot, he was invited to join Bolke's Jagdstaffel II squadron, and he soon excelled in combat by following the Bolke dicta, which included approaching your enemy from above with the sun behind you, firing only when you get to close range, always keeping your eyes on the target, and attack with a group of four to six planes. By the beginning of 1917, the Red Baron, as he came to be known, had 16 confirmed aerial victories and he had already been awarded Germany's highest military decoration, the Pour Le Merit, and was a commander of his own squadron, the Yasta 11. In April 1917 alone, bloody April, he downed 22 British planes. He began to have his Albatross aircrafts painted red. As his title, Freer, was translated into English as Baron, it didn't take very long before he was known to the world as the Red Baron. His squadron was combined with three others to form what was known as Jagdschweder I, which was widely feared and known as the Flying Circus because of their colorful paint schemes. His younger brother Lothar was also a fighter pilot, but was far more daring than Manfred, confirming 40 victories and ironically, unlike his brother, surviving the war. Thank you. 
In July of 1917, Richthofen crashed in Belgium after being attacked by Captain Ro uh, Donald Cunnell of the Royal Flying Corps, and he suffered a severe head injury, very likely a skull fracture in that crash. Now, in spite of blurred consciousness and visual compromise, he managed to land his plane. Over the next several months, he still flew occasionally and had several operations to remove bone splinters from his head wound. He suffered from severe headaches, and there was a very noticeable change in his personality, which persisted from that time until his death. Against medical advice, he returned to regular flying with his group by October of 1917, downing 18 more planes over the next six months. This brought his total to 80 aerial victories. He was the leading air ace of World War I, followed by René Fonck of France, who had 75 confirmed victories, and Billy Bishop of Canada, who had 72. Both Funk and Bishop not only survived the war, but lived into the 1950s. But that wasn't to be the story for Manfred von Richthofen. Von Richthofen met his end on the 21st of April, 1918, under rather unusual circumstances. He was pursuing a Canadian pilot named Lieutenant Wilfred May, who didn't have a lot of experience, but he was also being pursued by a much more seasoned pilot by the name of Captain Arthur Roy Brown. Brown dived steeply at the Baron, fired at him before having to climb to avoid crashing into the ground. The Baron resumed his pursuit of May, but soon came under concentrated fire from Australian troops on the ground. Now, this was something the Baron didn't normally do. He knew better than to fly that close to the ground to risk being fired on from the ground. He ended up making a rough landing in this field behind me near the Somme River. The soldiers who had fired on his plane from the ground were the first to arrive at his Red Fokker triplane and they claim to have heard him mumble some things, uh, including the word kaput, but we really don't know for sure. The exact accounts of damage to his plane before being dismantled by soldiers who were seeking souvenirs are pretty difficult to come by, so we really just don't know a lot about those circumstances. Just, uh, I don't know, maybe a half a mile or so, maybe a quarter mile even in that direction, you see a chimney there and it's real prominent when you're driving into this area and the top of the chimney is missing. And I've read a number of people who have claimed that the top of that chimney was taken off by none other, other than Manfred von Richthofen himself when he was coming in for a crash landing, he knocked off the top of that chimney before landing in this field. I think it's baloney and I don't think there's any evidence of it. I don't even know if the chimney was there at that time, but uh, it's just one of those stories that people like to share. Mm -hmm. 
His body was taken to an Australian Flying Corps hangar at Poulanvi. He was washed by a corpsman and then briefly examined by four medical officers. The body was not opened for an autopsy. However, they did probe the entrance and exit wounds uh, with a fence wire to try to determine a trajectory of those wounds. Subsequent reports by two of the men who examined him, one who was a colonel and the other was a captain, actually conflicted with one another. So we really don't 100% know for sure what happened. But the most plausible conclusion after several viewings of his body as well as from eyewitnesses on the ground uh, suggests that there was a single bullet that entered uh, from Richtofen's right lateral chest, passed through his right lung, through his heart, and exited through his left chest. Before the Red Fokker airplane was scavenged and torn to pieces till there was very little left of it. Some thought that they saw a single bullet hole on the right side of the cockpit, cockpit which lined up with his chest entry and exit wounds. He was buried on April 22nd uh, in a village churchyard near here in Amiens, France, after a military funeral that was conducted by Commonwealth forces. There's actually a film that exists showing parts of that funeral as it happened. Now, Captain Roy Brown received a bar to his distinguished flying cross, but not the Victoria Cross, which had earlier been allegedly promised by Britain for the man who killed the Red Baron. Now, in spite of a number of claimants, no Australian soldier received any sort of decoration or recognition for having caused von Richthofen's end. The most likely scenario for the death of the Red Baron which seems to be supported not only by the eyewitness testimony on the ground, but also by the evidence on his body and on the plane, should probably give credit to a man named Sergeant Cedric Popkin of the 24th Machine Gun Company of the 1st Australian Imperial Force, who was firing his Vickers machine gun at the Red Fokker DR-1 triplane as it banked and fled to avoid fire from Lewis machine guns that were being manned by men named Robert Bowie and Snowy Evans. But we really will never 100% know for sure.
When Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, was initially killed in April of 1918, he was buried in a local church cemetery near the spot where he died along the Somme River. But in 1920, as the work was undergone to uh, relocate all the German graves into German war cemeteries, uh, the Baron was brought here to the Free Corps uh, Cemetery outside of the town of Albert. And he was buried in uh, number four, grave 1177, which today bears the name of Sebastian Postian. And that's because in 1925, after just five years of being here, uh, the Baron's brother actually had him exhumed and brought home to Germany where he lies today. It's often been said that there was no glamour in trench warfare, but for many, aerial warfare was the stuff of gallant knights of the air dueling in sim single combat above the mud and misery and death of the trenches below them. The fact that Baron von Richthofen was almost certainly brought to death barely above the trenches by an Australian machine gunner remains one of the great ironies of the war to end all wars. <laughs> 